A deeply personal experience with music changed the direction of my life. The depth of its impact has affected every aspect of my life philosophy, belief systems, and professional motivation, and is the creative force behind the development of the Bonnie method of guided imagery in music. September 21st, 1948 was the date. I was preparing for a music performance and chose the simple but beautiful Swan from Saint-Saëns' Carnival of Animals. Midway through the short piece, a radical and inexplicable event occurred. Suddenly, the tone quality issuing from my violin changed in volume and texture. It was of incredible beauty. The tone soared with an ease and purity beyond the boundaries of remembered sound. My first shocked impulse was to stop playing. My second, which overcame it, was an intense desire to remain connected with this ongoing beauty. When I finished, I was trembling, and as I sat down, began to shake even more violently. I was still shaking uncontrollably when someone in the audience asked if I would play another piece. I knew that controlling the bow and fingers would be impossible, but I hoped for a repeat of that marvelous music, telling myself if it happened once, it can happen again. And. After the first few shaky notes, it did. If anything, it was even more beautiful and expressive than before. This experience has never again been repeated. And on those occasions when I share this most personal of experiences, musicians will privately admit to me that they too have had a performance experience of this magnitude. After the life-changing experience that Helen Bonney had playing music, she set out to find some kind of way that she could bring more people to understand and experience the power of music. She became a music therapist, which in the 1950s was a brand new field. She also continued to develop her own spiritual path through prayer, meditation, and music. In 1968, she was invited to join the Cutting Edge Research Team at the Maryland Psychiatric Research Center in Catonsville, Maryland. As music therapist, she designed recorded musical programs to be used with subjects in research studies using the entheogens, LSD, and mescaline. From this research, Helen was able to see that persons who listen to music in deeply altered states of consciousness can experience very positive results. Gradually, she began to develop some guidelines for general listening and invited persons to come and listen to music with her, with a new consciousness. The guidelines were simple. Relax, clear your mind and focus on listening to music. These ideas gradually formed the method that has become known as the Bonnie Method of Guided Imagery and Music, or GIM. It was a catalytic experience uh, to meet Helen Bonnie. I was certainly interested in hearing her story. I heard it very personally as something in music being a mystery that seemed to be made almost real to her in a particular way. And that spoke to me a great deal. And when she talked about this new method that was coming to her through a visionary process, um, it was immediately apparent to me that there were parts of my own training in life that could be brought together by this training in counseling, training in psychology, and training in musicology. 
When I first got to know Helen, I noticed about her very quickly that she was a very adventuring spirit. And that enthusiasm, that ability to risk and to grow at her edges is something that she really translates and teaches um, all of us. By teaching us how to use the music, by, by teaching us how to use imagery, that we could move into those spaces not feeling afraid, but feeling as though there's more to be, there's more to grow into, there's more that we could be. My relationship with Helen and the music we played was very different from my other performing situations. I am a music professor, I'm a professional vocalist, and I'm used to thinking about how people are judging me when I perform. When I play music with Helen, I feel as though we're performing the music for a different reason. Because we have to perform music. Uh, we cannot not perform music, it's our life. And I always felt when she played violin and I sang that there was something she was extending to me, something that was holding me, uh, something that is holding me when I play music with her. Uh, and there's a, a combining of forces that makes the experience much different than what I usually have. The reason why I was led to music therapy was because of those deeper mysterious experiences in consciousness that I in no way understood. I felt like I, I was being moved by something extremely powerful that was uh, not well in my control and, and certainly not within my understanding. And I was very eager to, to learn from those who knew more about this. Um, so I very quickly um, latched on to Helen as a musical mentor. She's uh, such a consummate musician. Let the music take you where you need to go. These are the words that Helen spoke to me before she turned on the stereo cassette tape recorder. I stepped into an envelope of sound and my inner perceptions opened. Visual images, emotions, memories. It all came flooding to me and on the rhythms and dynamics and sounds of the music. The music was at times disarming, charming, challenging, and it never left me. It stayed with me the whole time. At times, Helen would make a gentle suggestion, a supportive gesture, and I continue to travel into my inner world. This first time that I experienced a guided imagery and music from the inside, I came to understand that music and I could have a new relationship. And this was a relationship of such intimacy that I really never believed could happen. As a lay person, not a musician, I had always been a little bit on the outside with music. But I came to find with guided imagery and music that music was no longer outside of me. That it was something that really was a part of me. The GIM approach is self-evocative. It's based on a theory that the individual psyche, when properly approached, will respond with the most efficient and effective imagery, and that music is the central evoking agent. The therapist and the music provide a setting within which the widest possible choices can be made. We call this an envelope of sound, or sound presence. And the element of sound presence introduced into work with imagery creates the powerful therapeutic differences between verbally produced and music evoked imagery. Deep conscious elements of the person are evoked through the imagery which arises in response to the music medium and the presence of the supportive guide. 
The Bani method of guided imagery in music is a very specific method. It is a method that uses music that has been put together in programs. They vary um, in length from 30 minutes to 45 minutes. Uh, the programs are put together for this method as a means of enabling an individual to have an imaging experience with music. Traditionally, the music that's used in guided imagery in music, in the Bonnie method of guided imagery in music, comes from the Western classical tradition. And this is music which has lasted through time. It, it is music that we know people relate to, let into themselves. Often it's, it's familiar, not common, but familiar music. And the pieces, the, the programs that we use are put together in such a way that there is a sense of, of a beginning that draws the person into the experience and then it moves, the music will move towards an active climax of some kind and then will taper down to a closure. Guided imagery in music is a transpersonal technique. People will often and easily move into a transpersonal space, a space that moves beyond the sense of their personality. It's in the music. It's there. It's easy to step into that space and move. It becomes a holistic technique. Not only is it, does it touch the emotions and interest the mind, but the spirit is also enabled to develop and to have expression. The hallmark of, of the body method is having a guide, a company, uh, a person into these altered states. Um, so it's very important for the guide to know how to use the language correctly in order to facilitate the, the um, uh, traveler's movement and uh, move, move deepening into their experience without interfering with that experience. That is the key. Um, and also it's, it's paramount for the guide to understand how to use the music in that process. So the combination of understanding the music and allowing the music to do its job and using words interactively with the traveler to help facilitate the, uh, um, the experience, that is what the guide's role is. The focus of my doctoral dissertation, my research, and in it, I basically asked this question. The question was, what is the difference between transpersonal experiences, specifically in guided imagery and music, and other kinds of experiences? What defines, in a sense, the transpersonal guided imagery and music experience, per se? And uh, the way that we went about answering it was through a, uh, basically a, a method where you ask sets of questions to make comparisons about different experiences and then to kind of rate those experiences along various continua. And that was really the research question, was what's at the transpersonal GIM end of the continuum? And the kinds of things that really came out of that were that the transpersonal experience specifically in guided imagery and music had to do with a combination of two major things. One is a sense of unity with something other than your conventional self. Another facet was that there was a sense of universality or a cosmic sense so that uh, there was a sense that something was involving a very large scale, an unbounded, unlimited scope of experience. Um, so you had, the, in a sense, the combination of unity and universality. Those were the two big ends of the continua that helped to define the GIM uh, transpersonal experience. This method provided a conduit for it because of all of the elements involved. Because it's such a profound form of listening and engaging and connecting with these great masterworks of musical art. It is through that that this great cosmic 
unitive potential exists. If I had one question to ask, it would be, how is it that the music can do all of this? How can the music reach in so deep, so quickly, and grab our heart and, and move us? All of my life, I found that music is a very, very strong part of who I am, but never knew exactly why. It's been a mystery. But there was something that happened when I was in high school that was quite interesting, which was that my parents um, were divorced. And when they were going through that process, I had gone to hear uh, Samuel Barber's first symphony. And there was something about it that just amazed me. So I went out and I bought the first recording that I ever bought. And I laid down on the floor in front of the fireplace every night for about three weeks, and I put that thing on. But what I discovered more than anything else is that when the music ended, I could think clearly for a couple of minutes. Something had happened to me. Something had changed because I had listened to the music. Music's vibrations and resonance seem to go to a cellular level where many times emotions are captured and experiences and memories are captured. And in that unfolding and resonating um, the experiences come to the surface and can be acknowledged, can be felt. And the beauty of music is that within its structure, within its tension and release, it provides a holding for that process. It provides a way to restructure, to support, to nurture, to actually change those vibrations and allow them, the changing the cells through those vibrations and allow them to return or to move forward to their, their healthy state or their balanced state or their state of, of potential. Everything that one experiences in a uh, GIM session connects to this deeper place. And this is the deeper place where inspiration comes from. This is the deeper place that the composers went to to become inspired to write the music. This is the deeper place that the musicians go to when they practice. And this is the deeper place that makes GIM so powerful because it connects us directly to it. It has something to do with the qualities of the music itself. So when I think about using music as a therapist, it brings me all the way back to experiences I had as an adolescent with music. I always had deep experiences of music, and that was in listening to music. As kids, we went out and we found those things. We searched out danger. It was an instinctive urge to seek out the unknown and to test, test the boundaries of things. And for me, the music was a perfect space for me to do that within. And somehow the music um, allowed me to go further into things than anything else that I experienced. And the music seemed to facilitate that and provide a, um, a space or, a, or a, a realm that you could enter where those things could happen and unfold. It makes me think of a, of a song, a, a lyric from The Doors. Um, music is your only friend until the end. And what I take that to mean is that for each of us, our experience of music is, is very individual and very personal and very intimate. And so the music can be a true friend. It's such a deep and pervasive uh, connection that music uh, creates. It, it evokes you know, very deep feelings, allows me to 
uh, to remember and, and think about things differently and, um, and particularly with classical music it's, it, it just creates a very deep connection with, uh, with feeling. and music process enables a person to have a moment of something extraordinary. When we enter into the altered state and then begin to listen to music and then allow our own inner world to open to that music, we have really stepped into an extraordinary space. It's something very different. Time is different. Space is different. We may have images of things that um, we don't have in our ordinary life. We could have a whole experience there that is very real. It's as real as anything that we know. And then we come back from that experience and are in our ordinary life again. But we've touched the extraordinary. And that's one of the things that is really fascinating to me and, and very special about guided imagery and music. And again, it's because the music has been there to take us into this space and then to bring us back out. It's different than doing an imagery experience without the musical support. That's a different experience. With the music, it's, it's multidimensional. This method allows us to really be in the moment and to, you know, to taste things fully, to, to see the drops on the leaves, to see the vividness of the color, to, to really take in all the details and the vividness and be in the moment and to integrate, you know, both sides of the joy and the sadness and to be able to hold it all. I came to GIM because I was wanting to heal um, the relationship I had with my father who had passed away and I had had all my life um, an unhappy relationship with him and didn't feel that there was really much love uh, between us and wanted to try to heal that um, place in my heart and let go. Compassion was opened up for me um, through GIM. Um, I think first by coming to a place of feeling my own um, goodness, my own beauty, my own um, true nature, which I think the, the music uh, really allows us or invites us to do. And then I was able to turn to him and understand that he too was a loving human being who at some point in his life had had a number of events turn and unfold in a way that led him to become uh, an alcoholic and, um, and an unhappy person. And when I could see that in myself and I could love myself, then in turn I could love him and I could understand that his heart had closed and that at one time his heart was open and that he had loved me as his, as his child. That was one of the images that came in one of the sessions, was him holding me up as a newborn to the world and presenting me to the world. And I was able to actually sculpt that after a, a session, and I have it sitting in my studio. And I think that it's in 
It's in feeling that and touching it and being in touch with that tender heart that makes us um, humans. And that's what makes us, that's what allows us to love ourselves and to find compassion for others. An important guided imagery and music experience that I recall was one in which I was working on a lot of major personal issues. And, uh, and the people that were there with me in the room, the guide and the supervisor, were also just very important to me, very strong presences and um, people that I trusted a lot. The first selection included two of the variations from Edward Elgar's Enigma variations. The first one is a very, I would consider, very active kind of piece in the music. It's flowing, it's moving, it's very imagery rich. I found myself in that scene walking along in a countryside with rolling hills and a sense of, you know, a breeze and a lot of activity. I approached what was a very large, beautiful, marble, uh, Romanesque building. It was very ancient and yet was also immaculate and it just had the sense of authority and majesty about it. And, and as I was feeling that, noticing this, this building, the second variation came on, which is a lot more slow, a lot more introspective, so the focus goes much more deeply and inwardly. I became suddenly acutely aware that inside of this building was intense emotion. There was, in fact, there was um, pain in this building. There was a, a sense of sorrow, a sorrowful pain, and um, almost uh, also a kind of an anger in there. And I, I didn't know what to make of it or what to do about it, but I was suddenly experiencing that depth of emotion. The music shifted again to the next piece in this sequence, which was um, the Mozart Laudate Dominum. And uh, in that piece, which is just so balanced and elegant, and, and the woman's voice <coughs> who's singing the text uh, brings enormous comfort you know, in that particular context. And it was just what I needed at that moment because there I was lying there overwhelmed by the sense of this impenetrable building with all this depth of feeling. And, um, and this music brought to me an image of almost, um, I guess, a white, diaphanous, light kind of quality. And, and it was um, something I perceived as feminine. And this angelic presence came toward me as this music is flowing and floating the way it does in the actual structure of the music. And I just, I just appreciated this feeling of something was coming to me to help. I, I felt I was in this, at that moment, a very passive place. I was just lying there on the grass, not knowing what to do next. And here was some help coming through this music. And at that point, the piece shifted again to the next piece in this sequence, which um, is a, an incredible piece that many people are familiar with, the Samuel Barber's Adagio for Strings beautiful melodic strains and phrases, but it just holds you in this place of such intensity. And again, that matched exactly where the experience needed to go at that point, because the angelic presence began to reach forward toward me and actually reach into me, which it startled me because I wasn't expecting it to get that close. And she actually went in to me, to my heart. and. Um, held my heart in her hands. I felt almost like I didn't need to breathe and that something else was taking care of that for me. And it's a pretty sustained piece. I mean, it's pretty long, so I'm sure technically I was breathing, but my experience was that it was this almost singular breath through the entire piece. And where I was, uh, my experience in this, was the perfect intersection between absolute agony in this touch of my heart and ecstasy. And, and uh, you know, just like that Samuel Barber piece, it was the most beautiful thing ever and yet barely tolerable. I felt that I was able to exhale and this angelic presence departed. And what comes next is um, a, a selection from Brahms' German Requiem. And the music is just very, very vibrant and powerful. I felt so strengthened by this experience, this encounter with the angel that I got up off of the grass. I felt like a, just a guy, you know, in this 
very, very powerful way and, and stood up and I realized that what I needed to do was to smash down this building, this, this magnificent structure that I was respecting as this massive authority, but it was very important that I break the thing down. And now I felt like I could. And as I started to break down these marble structures, inside there was this, as the emotion inside was releasing, it was in the form of, in my image, fire. And the fire was massive. I noticed that I was on fire, but not, it, not alarmed by it, not in the sense of, you know, I'm just going to get burned and I better protect my skin. It was more like, this is something about my true nature, and I'm going to let this fire do what it needs to do. It felt like part of me was being consumed by the fire as the building began, began to become totally broken down, and there was nothing, nothing left of that but fire. And, and then I was fire, that it was supposed to be a purifying force, that it was the force that would burn away the things that the world just doesn't need. And although it's frightening and terrifying in some way, as it does that, it was really necessary and had to be done. And as the piece then shifted into the final piece in that sequence, which is Strauss's um, Death and Transfiguration, it just allowed me to feel ever more part of something larger, so that it, I felt like this was just something, something on a more cosmic level, going through something purifying. To feel that touch on my heart, it was like it didn't need to mean anything. It was, what, it was actually just living through that, which was most important to me. Likewise, the feeling of breaking that building down and, and becoming fire. Those were things that, while there may have been some symbolic correlation to my life, which was important, it was the living through that in that music, which was the most important thing to me and made this experience what it was. It seems to me that the, the process a composer goes through in creating one of these works is a very human process of working out problems. The composer may begin with a melody or an idea and then has to stick with that and work, and work through it and work through whatever comes up for them on whatever level, then that working through becomes part of the sound. And so when the piece is listened to, you're hearing this music and, and yet it's a representation of this human being working through a problem. And so, the clo so when the client gets hooked up with that working through, it helps the client work through whatever problem they're in the process of, of trying to move through. When I was diagnosed with breast cancer, I had already um, begun the training in guided imagery and music, so I was used to facilitating uh, those sessions for other people, and um, as well as receiving it from some of my colleagues um, in my own treatment and my own um, healing. Um, I also used it for myself, uh, even post-surgery in the middle of the night uh, in the hospital. Um, and took myself through a journey that was very, um, again, transformative and uh, healing. Um, it was almost like a call to action and uh, there was a real um, sense of well-being and success. And again, a lot of um, images of myself as uh, being healthy and um, strong and uh, connected and connected uh, with my own spirit and also with, with uh, a greater um, sense of connection with the whole universe. Each one of us has the potential for great healing within ourselves. And um, I find that this method um, of guided imagery and music really helps people to tap into that. Um, I think uh, that what we see um, in ourselves in everyday life is very limited and when we can get into that place of the imaginal world uh, we can see possibilities that we haven't even considered um, in everyday life. We really 
um, empower ourselves by realizing that that lies within us, that it's not something you go out to a doctor and receive a prescription for. It's something that you have within your own being. And uh, in that way, you can call upon that any time because it's, it's you. I developed pancreatic cancer and took the quartets of Beethoven into the hospital with me to do my own personal work because I knew I needed to break the cancer pattern. There was a lot of emotional work. One piece one day would evoke one thing and the next day the same piece would evoke its opposite. And so I came to know the versatility and depth and breadth of working with classical music. As I worked with the music and imagery in my own sessions with others and in putting together programs, I realized that the patterns of illness can be transformed and that we can recreate ourselves innumerably over and over until we arrive at a greater sense of self and become centered in that. As a result of an analysis of a series of studies, my own and some of other people, we are finding some very exciting things in terms of research with GIM. One of the best documented is the ability of GIM to change depression or de depressed mood in, in healthy adults, in people with medical conditions, and in people with psychiatric illness. And uh, that's, that's been consistent across the board. Every study that's looked at depression or depressed mood has found significant change, even in very small sample sizes where it might be hard to detect. Uh, GIM is very, very, very powerful for affecting mood, for changing mood. A set of unique benefits uh, of guided imagery and music in the, in the cancer care setting is that I'd say by virtue of its unique combination of elements, which is the classical masterwork coupled with a trained and skilled empathic guide and, um, you know, the altered state of consciousness where you're listening in this very deeply imaginative state to the music, that that combination provides a set of experiences and resources like no other service can provide in that setting. Indeed, what I found in this study was that GIM brought forth very powerful and rapid work on body image, the body parts that had been removed, the surgeries that had changed the body, the sexuality that had been impacted by this disease and by the treatments, roles that had been changed, redefinition of how you are in your family, how you are in your work and in your life. Um, an examination of values, and a very brave investigation of our own mortality. And that's an issue that people often don't get to until further on in a, a psychological treatment. These women were grappling with these very in, uh, important existential issues second or third session into a sixth session series. Um, there were remarkable transformations that occurred in just six sessions. The area that I've been looking at and most familiar with is the use of recorded music in hospitals. In other words, just allowing patients to listen to the music. Um, often patients don't have enough energy to do a whole lot more, but they can always listen. Um, and it's been found that you know music fits into a couple of categories, um, sedative and stimulative. So in the hospital, um, you can use sedative music um, to help patients uh, deal with stress and anxiety uh, and high blood pressure and that type of thing. And the stimulative music um, is, for, is used in um, post-operatively when uh, patients have been under sedation and need to wake up. So they're two good ways to use music. And it has been found that less drugs are needed for both of those things when music is used. When I played music to some of the pregnant moms who were on bed rest, um, I quite quickly discovered that I was really playing for two or three, or depending on how many babies were there. But they would say to me things like, oh, my baby's calmed down now. Now I feel relaxed. Then I discovered that Helen had looked um, particularly 
at the effects of music um, in with anxious states that most people are in hospital in an anxious state um, and she had done some some pretty sound work really measuring the effect of music and programming music in a number of different areas. I'm a neurosurgeon and, uh, and I spend a lot of time in, in the operating room. The cases that I do are typically long and they are fairly high risk. And I find that listening to classical music is very helpful, not, not just uh, to me, but to the whole team. It, it allows to, to set a, a mood of uh, concentration and respect in the operating room. That Baroque music, uh, in particularly, um, allows people to, uh, to concentrate. And I think it really enhances the uh, ability to give our best uh, in what we're doing. And depending on the case, I can, you know, have music that is somewhat more subdued and tighter and, and sometimes music that is a little more exuberant. Sometimes, sometimes things in, in the surgery get difficult. It's, it's hard to, to envision how things are going to evolve and it's clear that uh, we're, gonna re we're gonna go through a very difficult and long uh, period. And at times like that, I, I often uh, pay a little more attention to to the music and for example if I'm listening to some music by Bach I recognize that that music has been around for 300 years and that you know a lot of people have uh, seen something special in that music have drawn energy and positivity from the music and it puts what I'm doing in perspective and I, I think it's very very helpful it also uh, is not just the music but it also reminds me of the struggles that that you know that composers go through in terms of trying to uh, discover you know new uh, new forms and and just move ahead and it's it's very inspiring that's it's basically very inspiring I still play in concert bands I'm a clarinet player I identify myself as a clarinet player. And I sit in the middle of a band and I think of the people who got me there. And I think of the experiences that got me there. And I, I am surrounded in this sound field of other people that are playing and my note's just my note. But the sound field would not be the same without that note. And no one else's sound field would be the same without the note that I'm playing. And my sound field has to do entirely with what everyone else is doing. And there's a composer somewhere who knew how to manipulate that stuff. And Jesus, exciting. It is so exciting. The other day, I literally was in a concert playing for, some, for old folks uh, at one of the local retirement homes. And it was a beautiful, beautiful piece, just a gorgeous thing. And in the middle of it, I started to tear up, which is not easy for somebody who plays a little loud E-flat clarinet. Um, because I looked at those people and I saw in their faces all the folks who had given their time and risked their finances to make sure that I had music lessons. And I think if there was a gift I could give back to them, it's to let them know that there is a way that other people can enjoy music, can be taught to enjoy music, and can be taught to enjoy themselves through music, and can be taught to have happier lives simply because they've experienced music, not only as a performer, but certainly as a listener, that they know themselves better, that they're more comfortable in their own skin, they're not afraid of their own feelings, they've experienced them, people have told them it's okay. And I think music is the way to do that. Music is a creative, moment-by-moment -moment revelation, which is totally dependent upon the interpreter. When belief structures are active, open, and non-compartmentalized, the artist plays with a domain beyond his or her small and limited access to the music. And when the written music has issued from and through the heart of one of the world's great composers, a direct line to inspire playing and listening is possible. This divine collaboration awaits within great music to renew minds and to heal hearts.